back by 121. And in the previous presentation, what we did is we went through what is required for a cell to travel through a normal cell cycle. And what this portion of the lecture is going to be is if this is occurring, how does the cell know where it is? And the series of experiments that were used to show that there is this gradual production of proteins that will then disappear and they will cycle as they travel through the entire system. And there are many different types of cycling mechanisms seen throughout biology where you have this transient production of a regulatory protein that then says, look, it's okay to transition from G1 into S. And then everything happens inside of S that's supposed to occur. And then you can transition into G2. And even at the end of this, what we come to is that some point in time, there's going to be something that will allow the cell to go, no, we are not yet ready to transition from, say, DNA synthesis utilizing DNA synthase to make a complete copy of 23 pair of chromosomes. We need to repair some stuff. And you want to take a look at, hopefully when you're reading this, how Mother Nature has figured out a way to then make a new series of proteins that will hold the system in check until such times as the repair has been done. And I'm intentionally using the word repair because that's what actually happens. By designing an experiment where you can destroy the integrity maybe of DNA, what happens is you stop cell progression. And then in those instances when repair has been completed sufficiently and it hasn't been a lethal event, then the cell can continue to can go through the internal checkpoint, so you end up making two new cells. These are some major discoveries, you know, and a lot of these things started years and years and years ago. We're talking over a hundred years ago in terms of thinking about, you know, how does one cell become two cells? But it's only been in, you know, the last 25 years or so, I mean, 15 years ago, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the, the identification of and regulation of how cells tr transfer through all of these different steps. So it's all still very interesting work, especially when you think about how it is mutations can actually change the rate at which we travel through these checkpoints. So we want to control the cell cycle and external triggers can actually initiate this or inhibit the cell cycle. And that can be death of nearby cells, release of growth hormones, cell crowding, Literally imagine, if you will, these are all signals that are pushing on the membrane or establishing some sort of signaling system on the membrane such that the cell now knows it has to have, if these are external figure, um, figures, external impediments or external controls, then there are internal factors that can also regulate the system. And the G1 checkpoint determines whether conditions are favorable for a cell division. You know, are there adequate cell reserves? Is the size of the cell at the appropriate state? Meaning, do you have enough fluid to separate between two cells? The cell has two options if the cell doesn't meet all of those requirements and stop and fix the problem or wait for the conditions to get better. And you need to cause the cell to pause. You can enter with think the state we call G0 and in G0, it pretty much just hangs out. Okay. Until such times as whatever resources are required are now made available. And maybe in some instances, they may just hang out inside G0 for a prolonged state. The G2 checkpoint on the opposite side, okay, this checkpoint prevents entry into the mitotic phase, okay, if, condition, if the conditions aren't met. And most important role of the checkpoint is to ensure the chromosomes have been replicated and that replicated DNA is not damaged. Now think about this for just a second. This is a pretty big responsibility. You come out of DNA synthase and you need the DNA replication steps, right? You made a complete copy of it. And now you actually have to edit the entire duplicated genome. 
Okay, because if there are any problems detected, the cell cycle is halted. Okay, and at that point in time, you either DNA replication or repair of the DNA damage has to occur. Now, how do I say this? On the whole, we rarely, if ever, see a complete reduplication of the DNA. Most of what we're going to spend our time thinking about is what are the repair mechanisms that can actually be activated. The M checkpoint occurs near the end of metaphase. Notice now we are actually in, we are in the cell cycle at this, meaning mitosis of the cell cycle at this point in time. And what's happening, of course, is the M checkpoint is determining whether the sister chromatids are correctly attached to those microtubules. That's to make sure that you have nothing that can lead to what we call non-disjunction. Let me highlight that for you. Non-disjunction is when, imagine if you will, you were supposed to separate these things. So one chromosome goes to one pole, the other chromosome goes to the other pole. But imagine if you will, they don't separate and both of them go to either one pole or go to the other pole. In this case, Mother Nature is fairly unforgiving in these events. There are some examples with smaller chromosomes um, where, say chromosome 21, where there's a pretty high likelihood that if this non-disjunction event occurs, that the individual, the cells, the organism will actually get to a fetal developed stage where birth could happen. More often than not, though, this can lead to a lethal event if non-disjunction is rampant. Okay, Mother Nature needs to separate the genes on each of these so that they can be used properly. Okay, so having said that, okay, we need to make sure the cycle will not proceed until the kinetic cores of each of the pair of the sister chromatids are firmly anchored, okay, to at least two spindle fibers. Once that is, once that's happened and it's assured you can separate materials properly, it will continue. Now there are two groups of intracellular molecules that regulate the cell cycle. Those are positive regulators, which are going to promote progression through the cell cycle, and there are negative regulators. This just makes sense. They're antagonistic towards one another. And here's what you actually see. Together we call these the cyclins and the cyclin-dependent kinases. And the levels of these proteins fluctuate predictably. Okay, Once upon a time, people were looking at these in all sorts of different organisms, primarily Xenopus lavis and Spicula, these are the two organisms where you collected enough of materials to regulate the progression and then see these populations. Remember how I drew a red sort of increasing and decreasing concentration of a protein. And it turns out cyclin D, E, A, and B, cyclin A and cyclin B were the first two to be identified. When these were identified, People thought they had figured out, hey, we know how a cell will now proceed through this. Well, this was not all that long ago. How the positive regulators work, these are the cyclin-dependent kinases. And what you have is cyclin attaches to CDK. And cyclin binds to the CDK, and then a phosphate-donating protein, a kinase, is going to come along and phosphorylate it. This is why substrate-dependent phosphorylation is such an important idea for you to understand. This now allows for this entire complex, the cyclin CDK complex, to target now another protein to become activated. This then progresses the cell through the cell cycle. So these really simple ideas that we taught you a couple of chapters ago, you see now, I hope, that through those intracellular signaling pathways, adding or subtracting the phosphate can now regulate, in this case, the pre progression of a cell through a normal metabolic pathway and into creating, in this case, two distinct cells. Now, what does this actually mean? You can have negatively regulated molecules as well. Okay? So here you actually have the retinoblastoma gene family, RB, and another one of its relatives, P53, and another relative, P21. And the way this works is this. Through purification, people have been able to add back retinoblastoma and E2F to unphosphorylated, okay, so these are unphosphorylated here, and what happens is they're allowed to now not bind 
DNA. So it cannot bind the DNA and transcription is blocked. Okay, so this is the way it works. It's a negative reg regulator. However, ATP can phosphorylate this and cell growth triggers the phosphorylation of that RB. And what's going to happen now, phosphorylated retinoblastoma releases E2F, which binds to the DNA. And this now turns on gene expression. And this is what causes cell cycle advancement. So the negative regulation of E2F interaction with RB and the phosphorylation of that retinoblastoma protein regulate now transcription and translation. Primarily transcription and translation would happen later. So you can see with these two systems in place, you can figure out how the cell cycle can actually move forward. So we finish off the chapter. There's a few things I want you to pay attention to. The first is what the heck would this actually have to do with cancer? The first of which is that if a cell, let's just draw a cell for you here, a cell has a process where it goes off to become two smaller cells, okay, and this is regulated by all of those normal steps, because now this is going to go off to become two cells, right? And this is going to go off to become two cells. So now we actually end up having four cells over here. And this continues along, okay, so ultimately you end up with you. Now what if there's one cell inside of your body that goes, <laughs> The heck with this man, I don't have to follow the rules, I'm special. I don't have to do what I'm asked to do. Hell, I can use all of the resources of the cell if all I do is begin a gene mutation that results in a faulty protein that regulates cell reproduction. Or, tumor can result when reproduction of mutated cells surpass the growth of normal cells. And the plus and the minuses are this. This isn't a class where I go through all of the mechanisms where this could happen. We're going to go through a couple of them, but they're all fairly fascinating. And the idea, of course, is a moment ago I said, screw you, I don't have to follow the rules, I can do whatever I want. Well, imagine, if you will, a population of mutated cells, they all just decide, hey, I'm going to use all of the resources of the body. And then what happens, of course, is you end up building a tumor mass. And then what happens, of course, is they continue to use all of the materials inside of your body and this is what actually ends up to lethal events, where tumors that were once benign become malignant. So, thinking about that, let's think about what happens here. We call these groups of potentially mutatable genes proto-oncogenes. And they are normal genes, okay, that code for positive cell regulators. So normal P53 is supposed to assess for DNA damage, cell cycle abnormalities, and hypoxia. And what happens is, if these are in play, what happens is P53 will cause a cell cycle arrest. And if it's that bad, it will cause apoptosis inside those cells. This is why apoptosis was so important in our previous chapter. Okay. Now, if it's not that bad, you can repair the DNA, and that DNA will then once repaired, we'll allow the cell cycle to restart. And inside the lab, we'd use a series of different drugs to initiate these pathways and then figure out at what step they could actually be repaired, if damage could be repaired. Now here's a problem. What happens if the gene for P53 is what's damaged? And then it can't do its job. So the artist here sort of takes a chunk out of it. And P53 can't detect. DNA damage. It can't detect a cell cycle abnormalities, and it can't detect states of hypoxia. And what happens, of course, is the cell continues to grow, and if it allows for the cell to become cancerous, what happens, of course, is that that cell will now begin to grow in environments where these should not be occurring. I can't say more often than not, this all works out fine, because obviously we wouldn't be talking about it if we didn't clone out those proto-oncogenes demonstrate which residues are required for this to happen, and we know which ones tend to be more lethal than others. But the point is this. As you can see here, a normal proto-oncogene, P53, behaves in a specific way, okay? and a damaged P53 proto-oncogene behaves this way. This way, no bueno. Now, tumor suppressors our genes are for segments of DNA for negative regulator proteins. So what happens if we think about, say, that retinoblastoma gene is if you can imagine cells when mutated form 
how do we say this? A negative regulator that can't actually do its job. So if you think about what retinoblastoma was doing, and in fact there are specific types of retinoblastoma. They're called retinoblastoma because the, the actual mutation occurs inside of the eye, occurs inside the retina. And what happens, of course, is even though your textbook gives you an example of cervical cancer here, the negative regulator proteins can't do the job they were supposed to do. So RBE2F complex doesn't stop when it's supposed to stop, or RBE2X complex, RBE2F complex doesn't become phosphorylated properly. So if you think about what that might actually do relative to what we just saw inside P53, you can see the same sort of consequence. Now, this is slightly, so if we think transitioning here, if we think about what just happened there, those were for very complex genomes where we had to regulate, <coughs> excuse me, the movement of large amounts of genetic information such that we can actually duplicate it and create two distinct cells that will behave properly once duplicated. Prokaryotic cell division is in many ways much more simple, but it does it by binary fission. And this is the only way to produce new individuals. And by individuals, what we mean here, of course, is more bacteria. And what you can see here is binary fission is the major mechanism. And what happens is it literally creates a copy such that it makes a mirror image of itself. And then once that mirror image has been made, it creates this thing that's called the Fitzy ring, which is kind of cool. Just the name alone is the Fitzy ring, of course, directs the formation of a septum such that you take that one one sized bacterial structure and you create two smaller ones. Okay, these two daughter cells, the FITZ is then dispersed through the actual cell itself. Now you'll notice what's happening here. Let's go back to the very beginning. As we get to a replication size, notice it's the FITZ that now brings this structure together to pull that septum down. So the mechanism here is protein that's already present inside of this that will then allow for binary fission to occur. I mean, that's a great model to actually take apart inside of a lab. Should we have actually had a lab, we would have looked to look to regulate using specific concentrations of drugs at the amount of FITZ protein inside of the bacterial populations we were going to grow this summer. Maybe if you're around in the fall and you're interested and you want to see this lab as it's being done, or at least look at how we measure different concentrations of proteins inside of the cell, what we, you can do is uh, reach out to me during the fall and we'll see if we can accommodate that request. So I just want to switch gears here and then think about, let's go all the way back here to the beginning and say, hey, if we duplicate this structure, we end up making two cells. Well, what happens if instead of making a, let's go here, instead of making a duplicated structure, instead of taking 23 pair of chromosomes to make 46 pair of chromosomes at the end of synthesis, right? So G1, S, G2 at the end of S, you have 46 pair of chromosomes. So that will be split up into two cells where each get 23 pair each, right? New cell, 23 pair. What happens when I say, well, if these are for somatic cells, gametes are a slightly different story where we take 23 pair of cells and we send them through meiosis. Meiosis. And that meiosis leads to cells that are now haploid. As I mentioned at the beginning of the previous lecture. And those haploid cells are just 23 chromosomes. So this is when that one spermatocyte meets that one secondary oocyte. And inside chapter 11, even though we don't really cover it inside this class, what you would see is there's a mechanism in place by going through meiosis 1, MEI 1. Maybe I'll come back to it before we actually get to the final. I'll create some time for us to go do this. Meiosis 2. And by the time we finish meiosis 2, you have those 23 chromosomes. Now, the problem with this being done inside a biology class is it's not actually how it works in biology. Okay, this is the sort of general rule of how it works.
for males, there is, at least male humans, there's a completely different pathway than there is for females. Inside plants, there's a different pathway as well. So depending upon the organism, the story is slightly different. But this is the general rule, and this is why gametes are different than somatic cells.